All right, welcome back. Rejoining us, and this has been a pleasure, Justin, to have you on in rapid succession. Usually we go weeks, if not months, between our conversations. But we wanted to do a comparative analysis of basically the NATO fighters, because in recent months, you've had a lot of backseat time and a lot of exposure with a number of NATO air forces. So we wanted to get your thoughts in various mission areas on what would be the best airplane in these scenarios. So basically, we're talking about the Typhoon, the Raphael, the Gripen, the F-16, and CF-18. So let's start with air superiority, air-to-air warfare. If you had to go to war in any one of those airplanes I've just rattled off, which one would you pick? It would probably depend on the weapons fit, in the sense that if it was the choice between, let's say, a German Typhoon, a Eurofighter uh, Typhoon, and an American F-16, well, I'd probably take the American F-16 because it would come with D-model AMRAAM and uh, you know all the latest mission data updates and things, so your, your, your threat identification and, and warning things would all be super up-to-date. I've been covering events in Ukraine since the initial invasion, and it's a challenge to get a sense of who's winning or losing at any given time due to the limited amount of information coming out of the conflict and the inherent bias of traditional TV and print sources. So let me recommend something that I use as I work to get it right while creating current events episodes, ground news. Let's take a look at the latest around the topic of the war in Ukraine. In this case, coverage about how the trajectory of Ukraine's fight against Russia hangs on the outcome of the U.S. election. Ground News aggregates the articles on the topic, in this case there are 19 of them, and gives you a very clear bias distribution in the form of an infographic with the logos of the outlets oriented left, center, or right, which is based on ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. As you go over here, you can see each article along with a factuality rating, where the bias leans, and, this is important, who owns each publication. Once you decide what you want to read based on the information provided by Ground News, it's easy to click through to the articles and then back again. You can't get this kind of detailed breakdown at a glance anywhere else. Go to ground.news slash war to check it out. You can subscribe through my link for as little as $5 a month, or get 50% off unlimited access to the Vantage subscription, which is what I use. When you subscribe, you're not only supporting this channel, you're also supporting an independent platform trying to make the news more transparent. If you were taking similar weapons fit, so let's say um, kind of top of the line that each fighter is fitted for, so in the case of Typhoon, that would be Meteor um, plus uh, late Charlie model Amram, um, soon to be Delta. I'd probably be inclined to take Typhoon, provided that uh, I was going to war with some allies. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Typhoon is definitely the most um, impressive aeroplane that I've, I've had the pleasure to, to fly in and, and to, to try flying. Um, you know, just the, the unbelievable amount of power and lift that you get. Um, you know, I've gone into a, a you know supersonic entry into into a BFM um, merge and after a couple of turns at kind of four or five G realizing I'm still supersonic which is seems absurd because you, you think you pull off that that um, speed pretty quickly um, and that that was kind of 48,000 feet so it's a pretty high altitude but you know again re- up up there at kind of 48 and a half Mac 1.13 ish um, in dry power, and it was more than happy to keep going up. In kind of traditional air-to-air terms, just the throw distance that that gives your missiles, um, the amount of energy that they're that they're able to store. And I'm sure, as a Tomcat guy, you you understand that that get high and fast with a really long-range stick. If you've got Meteor uh, and Amram as a as a mixed load, and then four Asram plus the helmet-mounted sight um, for kind of straight air-to-air, uh, Typhoon is is really impressive. It's not my favorite HMI. Um, I would probably take a bit of time getting you really used to the the um, way that the displays, because they're, they're full color displays, but they're not the biggest displays. It's quite a kind of cluttered cockpit in the sense that they you, it looks like what they thought the future would be in the 90s. And so in the same way that Star Wars, the original, looks much older than it actually is, is because they were trying to do what they thought the future was going to be looking futury, but in the 80s. 
to me, a Typhoon cockpit actually looks a little bit more old fashioned than something like a kind of midlife upgrade F-16 or F-18, um, where it's just, you know, an 80s cockpit, but with kind of updates. Um, and I find the Typhoon Hotas, the, the hands-on throttle and stick, it's, it's kind of a monster. It's, it's very complicated. Um, fantastic auto throttle. The radar needs some love. Uh, it's um, you can it, it's a big, powerful mech scan, but but you can kind of tell that it hasn't had a lot of money put into it over the last decade or so because they were always looking to the AESA radar that is now finally coming into service in various air forces. Um, but yeah, air to air, it's, it's great. Well, I heard uh, an interesting thing at the NAS Oceana Air Show this year talking about. F-22 versus Super Hornet. And I was talking to uh, a guy I've known since he was nine years old, who's now a lieutenant commander in the Navy flying Super Hornets. He was in CAG-3 on Ike, just got back from the Houthi war, as it were. And so we're watching the F-22 demo, which is eye-watering. And he mentioned that they had done an exercise against the F-22 squadrons at Elmendorf up in Alaska. And because the F-22 does not have Jehemix, that the Super Hornets were always getting the early shots with their AIM 9Xs because the F-22 couldn't acquire and get off boresight shots without Jehemix. So strike capability against a defended target set. Is it Typhoon? Going after, you know, sort of self-escorted strike for want of a better uh, you know, term. If it was a choice between those, I'd probably opt actually for either either Rafale or Gripen, depending on the the range and, and the weapon loadout, because both of those have a fantastic internal electronic warfare suite for self-protection. So neither is stealthy, although uh, particularly Rafale does have some um, radar cross-section, particularly frontal cross-section reduction features. It's not a stealth airplane, but it has a lower frontal RCS than a lot of its its competitors. But that, that the way that on both Rafale and Gripen, the way that the EW um, is is kind of managed within the cockpit flow is is really intuitive. It's almost carefree, as with as with Typhoon as well. Um, really, really good passive detect and and kind of ID and tracking. So the the, the combination of of decent ECM uh, as so electronic countermeasures and uh, good ESM. Uh, which is also excellent, as I said, on Typhoon, um, gives you that pretty good self-awareness. It's situational awareness. It's not quite F-35 situational awareness, which obviously I haven't had the chance to fly in myself or have flown in the Sims, where you know, you've know you got fantastic 360-degree awareness. It's kind of one of the, the biggest selling points in F-35. But yeah, Gripen uh, and, and Rafale, I find the way that information is displayed on Gripen um, more intuitive. Uh, you've got bigger displays in terms of the big three cockpit displays. And the way that the Swedes go about it is trying to strip out as many of the mental processes as they possibly can by automating them. So, for example, really, really intuitive indications on time on target um, of, you know, as you maneuver on and off, as things change, you get a really, really good intuitive indication of exactly how much you need to adjust your heading, adjust your speed. Um, where you are relative to your time on target on your mission profile. And also, you know, things like they don't tend to do, tend to do fuel, burn, uh, fuel burn in terms of just fuel flow and, and a total, um, which then gives you an extra just bit of calculation. You, you're constantly running in the background. Um, instead, they just give you minutes. Um, you can get to fuel flow and totals if you want, but uh, up front, it's just minutes. So it's just stripping one thing out. Um, you know, equally, the give you visualizations of weapon envelopes, both yours and opposing weapon envelopes, dynamically in real time on an SA display. So although you can do your max bolt, min bolt range, um, no escape zone, R max calculations as altitude heading speed relative changes, it also just allows you to check at a glance. Um, and so it, if you were doing a sort of self-escorted strike or as part of a big dynamic force, especially if you didn't have uh, the luxury of flying a huge amount, and therefore we're trying to keep current with less flying time. Uh, Gripen would probably edge it out. Over longer distances, though, it's a small airplane. Um, the same amount of load, particularly a multi-role load, will, and external fuel will have an increased drag and performance penalty compared to a bigger airplane. 
So Rafal over longer distances, sort of self-escorted strike is kind of what it was designed to do, projecting power from France down into sub-Saharan Africa if need be. You know, you've got this big central display. It's not actually gigantic, but it's got a collimated kind of central site, which you look in and it basically it's almost uses kind of mirrors to, I, I think it's not quite mirrors of magnification, but it's got a relatively normal sized but very high resolution central display, which because of the way that the magnification works, looks like when you look into it, that it's like a meter or something. So you, and it's, it's usable. So you've got this really big central usable display. Um, and with the good EW, really some of the best air to ground radar mode to weapon handoff and use uh, integration I've ever seen. I mean, really slick, um, which again is super important if you're not a stealth airplane, you're relying on EW self escorted. So you might well be, for example, very low at night um, where you really want that workload heads down to be minimum. The limitation on Rafale, of course, is that unless it's fitted with Meteor, which it, it, it is sometimes in French service but and in Indian service, but it's an expensive missile and there aren't a huge number of them, because Rafale users don't get AMRAM. They're limited at the moment to MICA. There is a MICA 2 coming, but it's it's quite a short range air to air stick compared to a C or certainly D model AMRAM. F-16 and F-18, I mean, yeah, but designed to very much aircraft designed to work as part of a lot of a Kameo. So designed to give you that, that broader SA of what everybody else is doing. Um, not necessarily kind of 360 SA in any way, but to link up with the rest of the package and yeah, I'd say probably F-18, the legacy F-18 that I flew with the Canadians anyway, was, sorry, CF-188 Bravo, to be precise. Really nice HMI, probably my favorite HOTAS. Um, it's just super intuitive, that Boeing HOTAS, um, at least for me to use. And I really love the way the displays are set out. It's They're never difficult to read. They're no more cluttered than they need to be. And the, the way you interact with things with the, the um, castle switch on the HOTAS is just super simple and intuitive. Uh, whereas the air-to-air radar stuff and, and IFF and things are just a bit more complicated. Whereas F-16, you kind of flip it around and it's super slick for air-to-air. Um, but the displays are inset and they're a little bit small. And just kind of targeting pod stuff, you're kind of uh, looking around. And with the DM uh, target management switch and data management switch, there's kind of context-dependent, long, short combinations, which I'm sure once you're into it are super intuitive. But for me, it's just a little bit more complicated for particularly air to air, air to ground stuff with the targeting pod and weapons management than the F-18, despite the fact that they're usually the same targeting pod and the same weapons. Um, so if it's simpler and it still works, then yeah, for me, like air to air is easier to manage in a F-16 versus an F-18 and air to ground is a bit easier to manage in an F-18 versus an F-16. Do, do the Canadians have helmet mounting queuing in their CF-18s? Yep, they've got JMX. Uh, so, join well, you have so where is your next adventure taking you where, where you could get some some tactical aircraft time? Hopefully a bit more F-16 time in January in the States with one of the Air National Guard units and um, uh, potentially some uh, looking at some Tornado um, users. Uh, not confirmed, so I <laughs> won't jinx it. Um, clearly the, the, the one that's got away so far is the, the Mighty Eagle, but... Um, uh, working on it. We'll see. So, Justin, always great to get your insights. I know you're a busy man. Uh, safe travels, and uh, hopefully we'll see you stateside. Hopefully you can swing through the D.C. area on your way to fly the F-16 with the National Guard. But thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.